Hello again and welcome back to the vlog. Um, I'm in a bit of a strange place at the moment. I'm sort of between pieces while simultaneously still working on stuff that theoretically is finished. Uh, so this week I'm going to be mostly talking about community of objects. Yes, still. Um, and some sort of changes that are happening to that uh, leading up to our performance of it at Huddersfield Contemporary Music Festival on the 20th of November. Um, but apart from that I've been I've gone back to a piece that I mentioned a couple of episodes ago, uh, which I've given the tentative title of White Space to, which was about exploring space of the page versus space in the studio. And when I last talked about it, I had made a kind of a score in a little book and then done absolutely nothing with it. So I've taken that a little bit further this time. But I'll start with Community of Objects. Uh, we performed this at the Royal Academy of Arts uh, a little over a week ago now. Um, which was very helpful. We, we planned this as sort of a test run for Huddersfield uh, because one of the challenges we have for Huddersfield is that we have to fit this piece into 10 minutes and it's, yeah, that's a real challenge. <laughs> it's, it's very difficult to tell how long it's going to take, partly because it's a matter of equating number of boxes versus numbers of performers and then not knowing how long anybody's going to take to look at any given box. Um, and you can't extrapolate that from previous performances because the boxes have to be different every time. Um, or maybe got by a different person. It, it's really, really hard to work out. And I think what we're actually going to have to do is to have maybe one of us have some form of timer going during that performance and just somehow pass a signal along to the others to say, right, we're halfway through. Um, that kind of thing because um, the, while we were down to 10 boxes for the Royal Academy performance, um, and that's between four of us, and I'm pretty certain that that was at least 15 minutes long, um, in spite of being massively reduced on what we had at Snape or Brighton. Um, to give some context, the first performance was 21 boxes across three people, and that took 25 minutes. So it's really hard sort of trying to work these things out. Um, with the reduced number of boxes though, I've been exploring different uh, scales of box and different styles as well. So the boxes that we used at the Royal Academy are all quite different. Um, there's, there's sort of repeated models, but mostly sort of they're, they're different heights and styles and as well as the sort of slightly differing colours. And this is the first time I've tried this. I've been thinking about it for a little while, but it's... I, I think when you've got a lot of boxes, you don't really need it. The, the similarity actually is quite enticing. Um, but when you don't have very many boxes at all, if they're all kind of small and look more or less the same, it doesn't really look like anything from a distance. And at Huddersfield, we are probably going to be a fair distance from some of the audience. And I think the more of a visual impact it can make, the, the better that'll be. Yeah, so I made changes to the boxes. We also made some changes to the way we proceeded with the piece um, in that we felt that at the Snape Maltings performance, there was just kind of stuff happening all the time. There was no sort of moments of tension and relaxation, sort of quieter moments where just one person's doing things. So we felt that we'd manipulate that a little bit and um, we decided to start with a solo, uh, which I designated to be Tim. And I did choose which box he should start with, but he still didn't know what was in it. Um, and the idea behind that was that to start with a box that was very focused on those kind of papery sounds to kind of set up the sound world of the piece when only one person is doing things. And then we all sort of started picking up our own boxes and doing other things. Um, I felt that worked really well. I felt it was very strong and it helped to really draw people into the piece. Um, yeah, there also I've been thinking a lot about the, you know, the fact of there being four of us performing it um, and what, how that differs from when three people have performed it. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with an interview that James Saunders put me on to, which he did with Antoine Berger, which looks at the sort of different relationships when you write for one person or two people or three people or whatever, and how that changes how they interact and how, what, that, what the meaning actually is of those different groups. I'll put a link to that down below. It's a really interesting read. It's on James's website, so very easily accessible. 
Yeah, other changes I made was uh, I removed the change of gloves midway through because with the shortened time span it just, it really wasn't feasible. It felt a bit crushed in the video for Snape um, and I felt it was just easier to not think about it. So in the end we had two of us with plain gloves and two of us with rough gloves and then we all just took them off at the end and I thought that worked well actually. I was quite pleased with that. I think when it's, yeah, when it's that short it's it ceases to have any meaning. It just means that you're doing like half a box and then taking your gloves off. And also now that we're down to 10 boxes, that's just over two boxes each. Um, and so it's really, it really doesn't make any sense to try and fit a glove change in there because you don't, most, you know, at least half the group isn't going to have a second box to change to. Um, yeah, so that, I, I was glad I did that. Uh, we've also ditched the white dust suits that we wore at Brighton and for the Snape performance. I really like the look of these. They're interestingly peculiar, very dramatic, um, but at the same time I felt it was something to hide behind and it made everything just feel that bit more acted and less natural. Without them at the Royal Academy I felt that we were kind of bastards amplified, whereas at Snape I feel like we're playing roles even if those roles are kind of us, they're also kind of not us because we're not wearing something that is, yeah, natural to us. It, it just, yeah, I quite liked it, but it just, it, it wasn't right for this piece, I think. And so I think they're gone. Um, yeah, fond of them, though I am. So I felt like that was one of the best performances we've done of this. Um, I was, yeah, I was pleased with it. I thought it, it worked very well and we got a good audience response. Um, I was a little surprised that the audience actually sort of started picking up the trash that we were throwing over the table partway through the performance and sort of reading the instructions and um, unfolding things that we'd done. It was a little odd, I have to say, but it was nice also that they felt engaged enough, interested enough to do that. Um, it was just, it was a good sort of different experience for us of the piece. I think that was, was really interesting. So white space. Um, yeah, as I mentioned last time I'd done the score and I hadn't done anything with it at all and it's been sort of sitting in the back of my head for a while, sort of what should I do with this, how should I go about this. Um, so sort of in this little lull since the Royal Academy performance I just hauled out the video camera and the tripod and set it up in the studio and just filmed myself following the score and just moving about the studio, sort of considering the floor space uh, sort of like the page. I decided to not clean things up first and I've got some extra furniture in here and it yeah I there was a one point where I tripped over something and half killed myself on video that, that was fun um yeah so that was it was it felt a little odd to do to be honest um but at the same time I think it's been useful it's been interesting looking at what came out of that and sort of trying to distance myself a little bit and thinking about where it could go next so I've sort of done two two specific things with this so far. Uh, the first is I went through and took out stills from each sort of segment um, of the piece to just try and get a visual overview of everything. And those that are sort of, I guess, compound moments where I would be pointing in sort of one direction, then another direction, and sort of having to do several movements to interpret one instruction, I guess you'd call it, in the score. 
Um, so I sort of layered those up in Photoshop and, and messed around with those to get a different feel, which results in kind of creaking multiple Caitlins in the studio. That was that was fun. Um, but it's been interesting to see the sort of the scope of that um, as well. And it's really sort of also made me think that it's not just a question of the space on the page versus space on the studio floor, space in the room, but also then a relationship with the frame of the video and sort of thinking about that medium and how that then could be an interpretation of that. How, how does that connect? I uh, haven't got any conclusions on that yet, but it's just been an interesting sort of thought process to go through. Um, the other thing I did was to, when I looked back at the video, and the thing that I actually hadn't really thought through was that when there's a score, you tend to read a score, don't you? Uh, because otherwise you don't know what you're doing. And so a surprising amount of that video was actually... and just literally reading the score and checking, oh, which direction do I need to go in now? Where do I need to be? Um, and so there's an awful lot of book handling in the video and I ended up doing a cut of that video material that was just the score reading. Um, which I found quite pleasing actually and it's it started me thinking about scores in terms of sort of their edges and the edges of the pages and the spine of the book not just what's written on the page um, and it's just a way of sort of tinkering with this and thinking through some stuff about that so with the versions I did I was kind of studiously not engaging with the lens of the camera not making eye contact as it were with the camera um, and it gives a kind of weird distance, I think, to the content of the video that I'm not looking into the lens. I'm specifically looking somewhere else. Um, and I quite like that, but I also wonder how it would change if I am looking into the lens wherever possible. Um, if I'm treating it more like a, another person in the room, how that then changes the whole feel of the thing. Does it change it? That's, that's a question too. Um, I'm also thinking about sort of room sound and acoustics and outside sounds and thinking about digging out some mm, instruments um, and just doing some tests with those as well. Uh, I think there's quite a few things to work through with this. I have no idea where it's going to end up. Uh, it could be a video piece, it could be a live piece, it could be nothing at all still. Um, but it's just one of those ideas that I, I'm feeling it needs to be worked through in order to see if it's going to be anything. Um, yeah, so that's about it for the fortnight. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, as always, if you have any comments or questions, please leave them below. And I'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.